ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930 present The Drive. The Drive with Paul Swan. Welcome into the Tuesday, April 16th edition. The Drive begins now on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. You know that sound bite. Uh, we've had that for maybe over a year now. One of the most memorable moments from the NCAA tournament. Of course, that was John Elmore making uh, herd fans uh, fall in love with uh, Marshall basketball all over again. Uh, I think uh, after the conference tournament championship, everybody was asking for a statue of John. I've, I've endorsed that over the years, and uh, now we're going to put him on the uh, on the grill and ask him how he thinks about that. John Elmore is joining us on the program, and uh, I don't think we've had you physically in studio for a while uh, ever since that NCAA run last year. And yeah, I don't think you've heard that that uh, we just use that every day, and probably will use that for another five, ten years. No, that was cool. I have never heard that, so that was cool to see. You've met so much the Marshall, and um, has it finally hit you? Because I know Saturday, the banquet, the awards banquet, where you were named the uh, Mike D'Antoni uh, Mr. Marshall Award recipient, and that's probably your official final event as a Marshall basketball player? Uh, it hadn't hit me yet. Um, I was talking about it with my friends the other day. I was just like, I've been so worried about training and preparing for this next step. Uh, haven't really had a lot of time to reflect. I'm sure I'll sit down one day and just – soak it all in and think about it but as of right now I'm still on cloud nine uh, I'm still very appreciative of everything that's happened and uh, the support system that I've had and the fans and the community mm-hmm. and the school so I've been really lucky but I haven't had a whole lot of time to reflect. You talked about the changing of the culture on Saturday and I think that theme came up a few years ago this basketball program wasn't what it is now I mean you've mentioned this in interviews in the past I mean, you'd have to worry about is your stuff going to be in your locker room now uh, it's a completely different culture at Marshall basketball, and you were right there at the forefront of it. No, you're right. Uh, I think it's just great for the program, great for the fans and the school. Um, Marshall basketball, dating to way back, uh, was always pretty good and always competitive, um, but it kind of got a bad rap for a little bit, and I'm glad that Coach D'Antoni and the other coaches and then put, now the new players have uh, really adapted and really um, made the best of the situation. I think it's moving in the right direction. I don't think it's finished yet, and I think uh, I think the sky's the limit, and hopefully we keep heading in the right direction. Was that CIT run, was that important, the way that this team finished, to have that to solidify the way this program has been trying to cr- scratch and claw and get itself back to being a contender every year? You needed this run. No, I think it was huge for the school uh, and the program, like you said, because, uh, I mean, not many teams get in their last game on a win. Um, We were one of the very few in the country that did that, especially being at home. You know, we had a tough loss to Southern Miss in the conference tournament, but bouncing back, coming back home, playing four games, uh, packing the place up, having the atmosphere like it was. Uh, Green Bay's coach came out and said that that was one of the toughest places he'd played all year, and they played at Michigan State and Creighton. So he put he put the Henderson Center right there in the same category as those two schools. So I thought that was just huge for everybody to hear that because when we do pack that place up and we do get the support that we've been getting, uh, I think it's one of the better basketball places in the country. Yeah, and the the thing that really I could feel throughout that uh, whole run was there have been years where Marshall basketball has been in that tournament. So this wasn't the first time, but it just kind of felt like nobody wanted to be there. Everyone wanted to be there, to see you set the record, to see CJ start climbing up the charts some more, set some personal records of his own. And it didn't feel like, okay, we're just here because we have to be. The administration wants us to be here. Coach wants us to be here. It just felt like, all right, this matters to us. We want to win this thing here. We're not just here for a, for a day. I mean, I, I didn't feel that in those runs a few years ago. And I'm not trying to knock those young men, but – it just felt like you guys knew, okay, we're here, we're going to win this thing. No, I agree, and that's that's where the program comes in. Uh, you talked about the program heading in the right direction. Well, that's one of the many uh, steps is having the whole program as a whole on board, and that goes that goes up to the athletic department, um, Mr. Hamrick helping us out, uh, Mr. O'Malley, but then that goes to the coaching staff. The coaching staff could have said, oh, no, we're done, we're going to the beach, we're going to Vegas, we're on vacation, uh, it's been a long year. They said, no, we want to play, and then Coach had a meeting with the players and said, do you all want to play? And 
uh, all the guys came out and said, yeah, we're not finished yet. Um, so as the seniors uh, gathered and talked about it, we were really fired up to have a chance to put the marshal back across our chest and play a few more games. And like you said, our goal wasn't to just, oh, man, we got to play a couple more games. It was we want to cut down the nets and win our last game of the season and go out with a bang. So we were very fortunate to have the games at home. You know, a lot of teams have traveled all, all over the country to play those games. So finishing my college career and the other seniors' college career at home, cutting down the nets, celebrating with the fans uh, was huge. And I don't think a fan left at the end of that Green Bay game. I mean, you looked around as we were hoisting up the trophy and celebrating at half court. I don't think a single fan in the building had left. So, I mean, it really meant a lot to us seniors just to see how they had rallied and uh, supported us over the years. And, I mean, it, it meant a lot to go out like that. Second postseason championship in program history first in the modern era so you know the one that happened in the 40s you know not many people remember that this one's going to last a lifetime and uh it was just a special feeling you know you're right I don't think I, I saw a single soul hit the door and it was just special it's like nobody wanted to go home they wanted to stay there watch you guys cut the nets and then hang out afterwards and <laughs> Uh, I mean, that was just a, a great experience. I, I think if people were not there, they're going to lie about it and say they were there. That's how fun, <laughs> special it was. John Elmore is our guest. And uh, you, now you're transitioning. You are no longer a member of the Marshall basketball team as far as, uh, you know, you're officially now able to declare for the draft. You're officially able to go get an agent. You're able to now make that transition to the next level. And you had an inter- interesting run. A lot of guys will go see how they fare, then maybe leave early. It felt like you were doing this to get an idea of what that's going to be, what that next step's going to be, and then you came back, and then you did it again. A lot of guys would just say, okay, I've got everything. I'm done in college. I'm good. I mean, you could have left last year after the NCAA tournament on a high note there because that's never guaranteed you're going to get back. No, no, you're right. Um it was tough. You know, I declared last year without hiring an agent and uh, tested the process. I had three teams bring me in, Brooklyn, Toronto, and Denver. Uh, so I got that experience. I went and worked out with some of the top guys in the country in those workouts. Uh, I think I fared pretty well. So uh, it was good. Um, at the end of the day, I'm just talking to my family and the coaching staff. We found it best that I come back and just keep improving, working on my body, working on my game. Uh but this year, I'm, I'm all in. Uh, there's no coming back. I've, I feel like I've been here for 10 years at Marshall, and it's been it's been great. But I'm excited to see this next chapter. Uh, I believe I'm an NBA NBA level player. My agent does. My family does. Coaching staff does. So I'm attacking this process head on, and I, I can't wait to see what this next chapter holds. How much of a difference is it now attacking this process? Uh, I mean, you're still working out. You're still trying to get ready. But you don't have a game. You got to wait now, and you got to go through the process, talk to teams. Uh, what's that process like? It's fun for me because I've always been a guy that likes training as much as actually playing the game. So, I mean, the off season is uh, I love it. It's one of my favorite parts of basketball because during the season you you're constantly worn out. You're playing game to game. You're traveling. You're flying everywhere, which is which is fun, but it's a grind. And this off season, I kind of uh, I'm kind of on my own schedule, working out with trainers and stuff like that. But I, lo- I just love everything about the process, so the off season is one of my favorite parts of basketball. You mentioned your family. Now, you and your and your father have a, a distinct record now. You know, you have scored the most points of a father-son combo of anybody. You've uh, you've edged out the Curry, so you've got that nice little title. So if you ever meet him, you can maybe bring that up. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know how that would go over, but how important is that support system? There are guys – throughout the years of college basketball, maybe haven't had that support system or have someone guide you properly and they just haven't been able to maybe fulfill their dreams or their expectations fall short. Just how important has those uh, those members of your family been to try to guide you to get you to the next level or at least you know help you progress so you feel like it's always moving forward, you're not regressing? It was uh... – a huge part of my success, uh, starting from my mom and dad. Um, they did whatever it whatever it took from the young – as long as I can remember, they were always there for me. Uh, whether that was financially, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever, they were always – they always had my back and did whatever it took to put me in the best position as possible, whether 
It was my dad coaching my AAU team, recruiting kids to play on the AAU team, driving us all over the country, hotel rooms, everything. Uh, taking me to the gym in the morning, at night, after school, during school sometimes. My mom got mad. But um, whatever it took to put me in a great position to succeed, they did it. And I've, I've just been very blessed and fortunate to have them. And then, then I've got my two sisters who uh, – their basketball minds as well. They never played, but they love the game, and they always they always talk junk to me if I do bad. They always kind of get on me. But then you got Ott, my brother, who uh, we spent some time at Marshall together, and I mean, we grew up playing together, always had each other's backs. And he's been a huge influence on my game as well. If I did something wrong during the game or something was going on, he'd pull me aside and be like, try doing this and this. So having him actually there at the games, and we lived together through college, uh, I wouldn't trade those moments for the world. And then, then you got my fiance, who I met at Marshall, who uh, came to the gym every night throughout my four years playing and rebounded for me. A lot of people don't know that. She came every night to the gym, homework, no homework, tired, uh, sick. She was there rebounding, running around, chasing my misses. So a lot of credit goes to her as well. So like you said, I've been really lucky. A lot of people don't have that, and it's, they, have, they have a tougher road. But I, I've been really blessed to have the system that I do. That was um, that was a special moment for all the fans. You shared that moment with the fans uh, proposing to her and, and her saying yes. Um, I'm sure there was maybe just in the back of your mind, like, please don't say no. Yeah, I mean, say yes, don't say no, please. Yeah, I talked to Coach D'Antoni before the game just to let him know what was going on and make sure he was okay with it. Um, and I was like, Coach, if she says no, man, I might have to, I might have to skip the game and hightail it out of here. That wouldn't be a real good look. But he was real supportive, and uh, Mr. Hamrick and everybody else was on board. Uh, so, I mean, Marshall kind of has became my family. Uh, I've lived here the past five years. I've grown up here. Uh, learned a lot about myself and other people here so I've just been very fortunate for how everything's turned out. How excited are you for the future not necessarily what's coming next as far as your basketball career but I mean you know it I mean you can't hide the fact that you're going to be back you're going to be a hall of famer I mean your numbers are silly ridiculous how many you've set and how many you know Benchmarks have been rewritten. I mean, Chuck McGill has a an article on the website now, herdzone.com, just outlining how crazy your career is. And I mean, it's not ego, but you know you're coming back because we can't deny <laughs> the fact that uh, pretty soon there's going to be a chance of retire John's number, put it up in the Henderson Center. You know, we joke that last year during the NCAA tournament, I had a lot of people call and say, hey, just go ahead and put the guy's statue on <laughs> order now. Um, how fun is that knowing that you – made such an impact on Marshall, not just the record books, but, you know, people will love you forever now. That was my goal coming in was to um, to leave a legacy. That was my biggest thing. Uh, my family's been big on it. Uh, I've always thought highly of legacies and tr- I always try to do things the right way. And if you watch some of my interviews from freshman year and sophomore year, I was like, look, I don't care about the statistical records. I want the team records to just be as crazy as possible. I was like, I want to hang a banner, and I want to go in the rafters. That was my two goals when I got here. I wrote them down. I told people in interviews, I said, banner and rafters, two goals. And uh, first one's been done. We we hung a banner last year, did it first time in 31 years. So that was just nuts, that whole ride and how much fun we had and the the system of coaches' offense and defensive schemes and then – the support system we had and how everybody kind of rallied around the basketball program was just awesome to see. But then you talk about like the legacy part of it. Um, you see the guy's name's Hal Greer, who I think died died yesterday, April fourteenth, two thousand eighteen. So two days ago last yeah. year. Wow. Yeah. So I wanted to just you think about guys like Hal Greer and all those guys before me, Dan Tony, Skip Henderson, John Taft, um, just some of those legends, and you want your name to be beside them. So. Uh, that was always my goal, and I tried to do it the right way. And I had great teammates, great family, great coaching staff that always put me in positions to succeed. And like you said, there's a lot of records, but I missed a lot of shots, and I had a lot of turnovers, and my guys never quit on me. So just very fortunate. But you were in a great system. You had an opportunity to, to make mistakes, to shoot up a shot that you, know, you maybe wasn't your best shot, and no one lost faith in you. And you were, I thought, very fortunate to have. Um, I mean, sometimes you got to put the whole team on your shoulders, and other times, maybe that shot's not going down. And you had a guy you run with with C.J. Burks, who you, know, you two were 
just one of the most dynamic duos, uh, the Grace Marshall basketball. And there have been some great players here. And, I mean, your name, his name, probably going to be connected together forever when it comes to Marshall basketball. Yeah, I, I give a lot of that to Coach D'Antoni. Uh, he, he says it all the time that he sets the keys on his desk and it's up to you to pick him up and go to work. And he put the keys on his desk. I picked him up and we never looked back. I mean, there was numerous times during the year that I might have doubted myself or got frustrated with what's going on or we were losing games and I wasn't playing my best and I'd walk over to coach D'Antoni in the middle of the game and be like coach what what do you see man what what should we do and he's like look John I said I can't tell you what to do you got to go out there and be yourself he said just be be John and I mean credit to him because a lot of coaches would have yelled at you or said you need to wake up or you need to do this and that he said look I'm I'm behind you I go as far as you go uh just be John so Credit to him because that just that fuels your confidence, knowing your coach has your back. And then you talk about CJ. CJ had a phenomenal career here. I mean, how hard he's worked and how much his game has developed in the time here is just crazy. Like you said, um, I left a legacy. He's left a huge one as well, top five in scoring, major key part in the NCAA tournament win and that championship and hanging the banner. So, uh that's one of my backcourt mates, and I'm glad that uh, we were playing together rather than against each other. Yeah, and you look at your stats. So you had a lot of help, but you also made a lot of guys better. I mean, you don't amass a huge amount of assists just by uh, scoring all the time or shooting all the time. I mean, you were looking for ways to make teams look stupid sometimes, especially <laughs> with those lobs. Yeah, uh, it goes back to Stevie Browning being here. Um, we came up with a little play where we started running a backdoor lob, and he'd go up and dunk on people, and we got all over Sports Center. So that's kind of where that lob play took off was uh, him and me just working in the gym, kind of running a little play together. But then we started running with everybody, and now you see everybody's dunking the ball. Rondell had a phenomenal career here. Um, Jansen got a bunch of lobs this year. Tavion uh, was jumping out of the gym, dunking on everybody, it seemed like. So... Uh, I think the chemistry and, like you said, the type of dudes we have here um, just want to play basketball, work hard, uh, push each other to be better, and then everyone's happy when somebody has success. It's not like there's jealousy here and there. It's like guys are genuinely rooting for each other to do well, which is which is a great thing to have on a team. John Elmore joining us in studio. Paul Swan, your host, The Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. So. Uh, eventually you're going to have to go away and go uh, pursue that uh, NBA career. And, you know, maybe coaching is in the future for you. I've, I've heard you talk about that. But the, there's still some opportunity for fans uh, to see you because uh, fans um, gravitated towards you uh, every time. I mean, there were times where I'd see you just you're signing away, you're signing away. And uh, it was several minutes before you could even make your way back to the locker room after uh, post-game interviews. But uh, there's a couple more opportunities for fans to come out and see you and support you. And, uh yeah, I see there's a raffle as well where uh, maybe they can get a jersey. Yeah, so uh, me, myself, House Media, H-A-U-S Media, and Jeremy Stout in Charleston, uh, he runs select cards and collectibles. They uh, reached out to me, and they're going to do a big autograph signing in Charleston, or in South Charleston, uh, at his shop, Select Cards and Collectibles. And they're bringing me in. We're going to do like a meet and greet. Um, there's going to be autographs, pictures, all kinds of stuff that people can sign up for. And there's going to be a raffle for one of my game-worn jerseys. Uh, it's a black jersey. You can you can look at it on Facebook at House Media, H-A-U-S, or just look on my Facebook page or Twitter page and contact me. But I think it'll be a really cool event to uh, – meet up with everybody one last time, sign stuff, take pictures, because I fly out to L.A. May 1st to start training and begin that process that we were talking about, and uh, it'll be I think it'll be a really cool event. How special is that to go back to the Canal Valley? That's where it all started for you, really. That's where I grew up, uh, South Charleston, playing at the park. I was a little kid, third, fourth, fifth grade, and guys wouldn't want to pick me up in the first game because I was so small, but I learned to get there really early with my dad, uh, so they had to put me in the first 10, and then... The rest is history. I just I worked. How's your dad taking all this? Because uh, you know he had a great career as well. Uh, he had a, a a name and a legacy at Marshall, and he didn't even play for Marshall. I mean, that's how much of an impact he made during his playing days. Uh, he's been nothing but supportive. Uh, my mom and him have had my back every step of the way, and like you said, he didn't have the best history with Marshall just because of how tense the rivalry used to be, but. I think a lot of people have welcomed him, myself, and my family with open arms. Um, yeah, that was in the past, and they kind of mess with him, like, oh, I used to boo you so badly back in the day. But 
Uh, it's been great. I've got him wearing Kelly Green to the games, wearing Marshall logos on his shirt and stuff. And if you had asked me 10 years ago, would he ever do that? I would have said no chance in the world. But uh, I think I've swayed him to a little bit of a Marshall fan, and uh, it's been cool to see. It's going to be special. He comes in, and you know, everyone knows who he is. <laughs> and, I mean, that says something. I think that's a positive because we know who he is. We remember him. You know, me a little bit more than maybe some of the younger Herd fans because uh, I was around during those days. And, you know, there are a few guys from other teams that you remember. And I'm sure – Years from now, you know, somebody's going to bring your name up and maybe be at Middle Tennessee or Western Kentucky, and, and they're just going. I hated that guy. <laughs> no, it's been it's been cool. Like you said, he uh, he left a legacy here, even though he didn't play here. So that's just credit to him as the player and the person he is. Um, been very lucky to have him kind of teach me the ropes of the game. I was messing with him the other day. Uh, you know, he scored a ton of points in his career, and when we broke that father son scoring duo, I texted him. I said, Dad, my my back's hurting a little bit. He was like, oh, you need to get some treatment, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, look, man, I'm carrying you on this scoring record thing. And uh, he got a big kick out of that. So it was funny. Uh, he scored a ton of points, and uh, it was cool to see that record broken and have me and him as having that record. That's probably one of my favorite records of all of them I have. Okay, um, before we let you go, there's uh, there's been one burning question that has happened a lot. Um, your guy, CJ, had your back on this when I've asked. I just think that there needs to be some closure to this. Uh, you or Shayna Gore, who wins that? Oh, man. Come on now. Come uh, on. Me versus her. Uh, She's meaner than you. She is meaner than her. Uh, meaner than me. I'm a nice guy. But, uh... You know, she's a heck of a shooter, had a heck of a career at Marshall. Uh, she broke a lot of records as well, but me versus her in a shooting contest, I'm going me every time, man. Okay. All right, that's we got it on record. <laughs> you versus her. I mean, how special was that? Because I know you guys supported them, and they were supportive of you. I mean, they had a great run as well, and it was just fun. Marshall basketball was I – mean, I, I, I'm not taking shots at football, but I haven't even thought about spring practice right now. You guys took center stage and just kept it. You know, I think it's big for Marshall when all sports are good because it elevates the whole the whole school on a national level. So, I mean, some people don't root for football, they root for basketball. Some people root for basketball or football and they don't root for basketball or whatever, vice versa. And uh, I've always wanted to see everybody do well in the program in the school just because it it elevates them. If Marshall's ranked in football, they're on a national level, then people think about Marshall. Marshall's ranked in basketball, then people think about Marshall, and then there's Marshall football. So. Then you got the girls team who blew their expectations out of the water this year. Uh, Coach Kemper did a phenomenal job and uh, has raised the standard for their program. So I'm rooting for them. Uh, I know I've got to leave, like you said, but uh, I'll always come back and I'll always support Marshall as much as I can. John Elmore, our guest, man, congratulations for everything. You did it the right way. Uh, you left a great mark, and uh, it's just been fun. And now you get to go to the NBA and. Uh, uh, any particular team you're uh, you're eyeballing, you're hoping for, is there just that one team that you know that would be your dream team if you got drafted by them? You know, it wouldn't be bad to play for Houston. Uh, they've got a pretty good coach. I've and heard of them. Yeah. A pretty good system. Uh, I think he might be a Marshall guy, but no. I mean, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Uh, the workouts start here in the next month, so I'll start doing that, flying in, working out for teams and stuff. So. Uh, I like my chances. It's just a matter of who likes me and when I get the opportunity or my number's called, making the most of it, and I'm looking forward to it. John Elmore, our guest. You'll be, again, April 20th. Uh, there'll be a signing. Select cards and collectibles. That's in South Charleston. Also an opportunity to get a game-worn jersey. I, I know those are pretty precious to you, so <laughs> the fact you're partying with one is pretty special as well. No, definitely. It'll be a good, good event, so everybody needs to come out or get in contact with me about the raffle. We've got more on the way. John Elmore, our guest. Congratulations once again. Look forward to seeing you in the NBA here in a few uh, weeks, hopefully. Thank you, man. More on the way. It's The Drive. Don't worry. Paul Swan has the wheel on The Drive. ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the Tuesday, April 16th edition. The Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Thanks for joining me for today's program. A lot going on today in Marshall football, some schedule changes. So if you were making some plans to hit the road, follow the herd, uh, you might have to change that up just a little bit. So Conference USA released the schedule today. And the thing is, the Thundering Herd not playing one Friday game, not playing two, no, playing three Friday games this year. Now, 
it was previously announced that the Boise State game would be a Friday game, and that's on September 6th. Now two more changes. The first one is October 18th, and that's the Florida Atlantic game. That's Friday now, Friday, October 18th, and that's going to be uh, 6.30 p.m. And then the other game that has been moved to Friday, that's actually a home game. So if you were coming in, say, see the herd, you're uh, outside of Huntington, uh, you got to change your plans a little bit. Friday, November 15th, Marshall versus Louisiana Tech, and that's scheduled for 7 p.m. Now here are the times we have and the games. Again, a lot of these are TBA, but we do know that the game against Cincinnati is at 5 p.m. on Saturday, September 28th. We do know that the game against Middle Tennessee is 3.30 p.m. on Saturday, October 5th. We also know now that Friday, October 18th game at Florida Atlantic is 6.30 p.m. That Louisiana Tech game, as I just mentioned, on November 15th is 7 p.m. And then FIU, final home game of the regular season, Saturday, November 30th, it's at 12 p.m. I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm going to voice maybe a maybe an unpopular opinion. I'm okay with this. If this means better television exposure, because this is really the reason why you move these games. It's for better television exposure. And so I'm okay with this. And it seems like it's not going to impact the entire schedule. That Boise game, that's a Friday game. If that gets a lot of people watching, Friday it is, no problem. Also, if you look at that Florida Atlantic game, there should be some interest there. I think Florida Atlantic's going to be good once again. A lot of people are predicting that Marshall's going to be good once again. And so Friday, October 18th, if that gets a little bit more push, a little bit more play because it's on television, both those teams are in a good place, and this might mean something down the line for the conference championship. Friday, October 18th, it is Marshall at Florida Atlantic. I don't know how that impacts the Herd's travel as far as maybe recruiting opportunities as well. It's a Friday game. I know Florida is a hotbed for Doc Holliday and his squad when it comes to going down, recruiting. I don't know if that hurts it really, but you take that. And then, of course, the Louisiana Tech game, that's going to rush their week. I haven't looked at their schedule yet, so I don't know what their uh, travel plans are before. But November 15th, Friday, Louisiana Tech. That kind of shortens their week. They've got to travel. I'm totally okay with that as well. So that's what it looks like as far as herd football is concerned. Fast approaching. Believe it or not, we've got the scrimmage a couple weeks from now, just about. Actually, we a week and a half just about now. So the scrimmage is coming up, and then herd football will be returning, and they'll be playing on Saturday, October 31st. It'll be here before you know it against VMI. For the most part, that's pretty good. I like that. Television is going to be pretty important. We'll take our next break. Come back. We will continue on. It's The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. You're listening to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the Tuesday, April 16th edition. The Drive continues on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Paul Swan, your host. Thanks for tuning in. If you miss any part of today's show, you can find our show. Just go ahead and sign up on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, tune in. Wherever you get your podcast, sign up and we'll have the show delivered right to your phone, your device, your computer, whatever you're using to listen to your podcast as soon as it's made available. So we got a busy night as far as hockey and basketball is concerned. NBA playoffs, Eastern Conference quarterfinal game two tonight between Orlando and Toronto. Orlando leads the series 1-0 there. Western Conference quarterfinal action tonight, game two, San Antonio versus Denver. San Antonio leads that series one game to nothing. Game two tonight between Oklahoma City and Portland. The Thunder and the Blazers. I'm not staying up late for the final of this one, but I'll tune in. 10.30 p.m. tonight. It's going to be on TNT. Portland leads that series one game to nothing. Stanley Cup playoffs. I didn't believe this could happen. Tampa Bay is at Columbus. Game coming up. Guess what? Um, Columbus leads the series three games to nothing. Game four. Can you believe this? Could be a sweep. For those of you following at home, those of you who filled out a bracket, yeah, that's right, that is a thing, Stanley Cup bracket. I picked Tampa Bay to win it all. So, um, yeah, it's not looking good for me right now. Game four coming up between the Islanders and the Penguins tonight as well. 
Islanders lead that three games to nothing. How about the Islanders? I had a feeling they could make a run. I thought Pittsburgh, though, had a little bit more experience. Uh, Not the case. Pittsburgh Penguins might be ousted tonight. And that's all in the Eastern Conference. Western Conference coming up. Winnipeg taking on St. Louis. And St. Louis leads that series two games to one. Las Vegas. It's led by the Vegas Golden Knights, two games of one, and game four, and that's San Jose and Vegas coming up. That's 10.30 p.m. as well. That's been a brutal series. That Washington-Carolina game, that got brutal last night as well. Alex Ovechkin, he doesn't fight very often, but when he does, he nails people. And I saw some some pushback on Twitter, social media, saying, look, got to get away from this type of, of hockey. This old barbaric stuff. And and we're talking about some serious hockey fans, some serious pundits, people who follow the game, who report on the game, and fans as well. I kind of agree with them in the sense that, you know, I don't want hockey to be just like, okay, some guys get on the ice and beat each other up. We've got fighting. We've got boxing. We've got MMA. We've got all that. Now, I want hockey to still continue to be hard hitting. I want that energy. I want that physicality in that game. But when two guys just say, let's go, and you got someone who maybe not necessarily needs to be in a fight just asking Alex Ovechkin, let's go, and then gets hammered three punches later with a concussion protocol uh, now in his future, what does that serve the game? Now, I understand. I used to be a defender of this as well. Well, it's a tool. You fight, you get off the ice for a couple of minutes. Say you've got somebody who's aggressive, he's agitating your your star, you're going to protect him here. But I think there's got to be ways around that. You don't see somebody try to drop the gloves with, say, a basketball player if you've got... Look at this foot way. If Jared West was a hockey player, somebody would get annoyed with him because he is up in your face, he's defensive, he's aggressive... He's not dirty, but he's aggressive. And a lot of guys are aggressive on the ice playing good defense. And so if you got somebody who's messing with your star, well, you're going to go protect your star. Sometimes it's not even that. It's You've got somebody who's been pretty aggressive with you, chippy. And again, this is a physical game. This is a physical game. It's got the physicality of football. It's got the speed of basketball. You've got guys out there who are on uh, the ice for several minutes at a time, going at each other back and forth. There's going to be some heavy hitting. I'm not saying that there should be just this complete clampdown on everything that goes on, but at the same time, you got a guy who's in a concussion protocol because he looked at another guy and said, hey, let's fight. Alex Ovechkin's not going to say, nah, man. Alex Ovechkin drops a glove. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, you're in concussion protocol now. I'm Alex Ovechkin we got more on the way. We're going to wrap it up when we continue. It's The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Now, back to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. We're wrapping up today's edition of The Drive for Tuesday, April 16th. Paul Swan, your host. Thanks for tuning in to today's program. Don't forget... Again, if you miss any part of the show, you can go back and catch it live on the podcast. That's right, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio. Tune in wherever you get your podcast, you can find our show. And, of course, uh, we didn't get a chance to use them today, but our phone lines always this hour brought to you by Miller Lite. You can always join the program, except when we have guests usually at 877-420-TALK, 877-420-8255. Miller Lite, hold true, great taste only 96 calories. It is the original light beer. Now, if you were with us earlier, you heard our interview with John Elmore. If you're not someone who caught the show early, you can go back again, hit that podcast, and you can catch the entirety of that interview. And I didn't really want to break out the John Elmore stats during that interview because, well, it's numerous. I will reference you to the story that Chuck McGill posted uh, talking about uh, Marshall basketball outlining all of the accomplishments that John did. And, of course, he's got a lot. I think when the time is right and he is eligible for the Marshall Hall of Fame, he's getting in. You can't say no. Now, I know a couple people on that committee, and whatever their criteria is going to be, 
Uh, I think when he comes up, you put him in right away. If anyone's a first-team All-American, Herschel Hall of Fame vote, whatever you want to call it, he's your guy. I mean, he's the only player currently holds the record for points and assists for a Division I men's basketball league. That's a, that's a stat that uh, is pretty impressive. Only Division I men's basketball player in history with at least 2,500 career points and 750 career assists, finishing, finishing with 2,638 points, 783 assists, has the most assists of anyone in the 2,500 point club. I mean, it's impressive. I could go down the list, but instead of me just sitting here reading Chuck McGill's work verbatim, I reference you over to herdzone.com. Give him the courtesy of reading his story. It's going to be tough. Next kid that comes in here wanting to be a guy that has a banner, rafter, and you know, that's a great goal. If you're a kid coming in to play basketball, I don't think it's egotistical to say, okay, here are my goals. Banner, rafters. I want to put some banners up in this building. I want to put a banner up. That means we did something. And then I want to have left an impact, so they put me up in the rafters. And it's not like he was walking around like, hey, I'm Hall of Fame material. He's just confident in himself. And he feels that, hey, I've got a shot here. I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to make this shot. I've played you know, my college career here at Marshall, enjoyed it. I enjoyed the fruits of my labor. And now I've got this opportunity. I'm going to make this shot. And I go back to that interview, and I think the support system is really important because imagine what this Marshall basketball team could have been doing uh, in April if, say, another guy, another component of that team last year that made the NCAA run, I Dean Penneville was on this team, and I don't want to keep dragging his name up. I just think you look at a guy like John Elmore, he did it right. He took advantage of everything that he could at college, and now he's going to take a shot at the NBA pro basketball, maybe some coaching in his, uh, in his future. And I wish more kids would be able to do that. If you're a guarantee lock, if you are a Guaranteed lock. You're going to make money that's going to transform your life forever. You're guaranteed to be that guy, then you maybe should take that chance. But if you're not guaranteed to be that guy, and you still have a bright future ahead of you if you stay a couple years in college and then make the transition to trying to be a pro player, I think you got to do it that way. Uh, I hate the fact that ID Penavo did not do that. Didn't get the right advice. Thankfully, John Elmore got the best advice, and look where he's at right now. That's going to do it for this edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Good night, everyone. WRBC Huntington, W227BS Huntington, your flagship home of the Marshall Thundering Herd and The Drive with Paul Swan, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.